Welcome to this uh, special series of in-depth political interviews for this year's general election. And in today's programme, I'm interviewing the Liberal Democrat parliamentary candidate, Will Dyer. Uh, Will, it's a pleasure to have you here today uh, representing the, uh, the Liberal Democrats. Um, can, you please, can you please share with us, uh, particularly with, with our viewers, how your Christian faith has shaped your politics? Shaped it in a massive way, and I think it's it, because it's such a central part of a person's life. I mean, any job that you do, your faith impacts that and vice versa. But for me, it's more, you have to make judgment calls on a daily basis about what policies you're going to pursue, what issues you're going to take up. And it's kind of, your faith helps give you that focus uh, and helps also give you that drive that you're put here on this earth for a reason and that reason is not just to follow God, but it's also to try and leave the world, I think, in a better place than when you came in. Well, you're standing as a parliamentary candidate uh, for the Liberal Democrats in like, this election. Why did you want to, or why do you want to be an MP? I want to be an MP because I want to make life better for people. In my constituency in Bethnal Green and Bow, in my borough in Tower Hamlets, um, we have the highest rate of child poverty anywhere in the country. Uh, and we have the third largest housing waiting list in London, which also makes it the third largest in the country as well. And it's those kind of things, the people that I meet on a day in, day out basis, they just want a decent start in life. And for me, it's all about, I want people to have equal opportunities in life. Everyone to have the equality of opportunity. But you can't have equality of opportunity unless you have equality of education, equality of health care and equality of decent affordable housing. So that's kind of what drove me to want to become an MP. It's not just about representing your constituents, it's about building a better, more open, more tolerant and more united Britain. And, and, and Will, can you share with us uh, why you decided to choose the Liberal Democrats? I mean, so I decided to choose the Liberal Democrats. Uh, so I grew up in a uh, little town called Rygate in Surrey. Um, pretty much the, it was either Conservatives or Lib Dems there. Labour weren't really a thing. But it was more that the Lib Dems embodied that community politics. I remember I attended a youth club when I was younger and actually it was the Lib Dems that really helped um, get funding for that youth club. And it was more like the pavement politics of it all, that you could, you could go and speak to someone on canvassing on a Saturday. they give you some casework, say they were having problems with their benefits, having problems with their housing. You'd go and speak to a council officer about it during the week, and then the next week you'd be back and you'd be able to say, look, here's the results of what we've done. But also I think for me, so one of the main reasons I joined the Liberal Democrats is a bit of a kind of personal reason for me. In the manifesto in 2010, the year that I joined, um, there was a commitment to 0.7% of gross national income to international development. That may seem incredibly dull, but basically what that meant was in 2015, the Lib Dems, Michael Moore MP, and I was lucky and fortunate enough to help in a little way on that, on making that bill happen. We managed to get that passed into law. Now to put that in perspective, that's a zero, that was a 0 0.15 rise to get us up to the 0.7%. What that means in practice is I think a £2.4 billion rise in our international defence spending, and sorry, in our international development spending. That's huge. That is absolutely massive. And actually, the Liberal Democrats, we were the only ones to have it in our manifesto in 2010 and delivering on that and being able to kind of say, you know, I helped do that. You know, and that was really quite special for me. Excellent. Now, it's been uh, a year since the uh, British people had the historic opportunity to vote on our membership of the European Union. Uh, as we know, uh, the vote last year went in favour of withdrawal from the European mm -hmm. Union. Uh, what is your party's stance on, on Brexit? So our party's stance on Brexit, we believe that Britain's future is better within the European Union. Um, we believe that the decision taken by the British people uh, last June was a valid one, um, but that doesn't mean that you stop campaigning on the issue. We voted on the 23rd of June for departure, 
we didn't vote on a destination. We do not know what the deal is going to look like at the end, and Theresa May is making choices every single day about the life that, the, about the life that Britain is going to have after um, we potentially exit the EU. Uh, life. Uh, after exiting the single market, about protecting EU rights. She's making those decisions without consulting the British people. What the Liberal Democrats would want is a referendum when we have a deal on the table. There you have two concrete options. You have a deal, which if, you, if the British people voted for, we would leave the European Union on those terms, or the option to remain. Actually, that gives us two concrete choices, because as, as I said, we voted for departure, a referendum allows us a destination. We don't want to start this process with democracy and end it with a stitch up. On that issue of offering the British people another referendum on our, on our EU membership, as it were, you know, isn't that actually going against the will of the people? That uh, the majority of the British people voted to leave, and here you are saying we're going to propose another referendum, uh, and maybe the British people are now a bit sick and tired of politics and a bit sick and tired of, of referendums. I, mean, when I think that the British made. politics are probably a bit fatigued anyway, but that's not really <laughs> our fault, that's more Theresa May's fault. Um, but no, it, it's the thing. So there were a lot of debates about what exit would look like uh, in 2016. I remember it. I, will, I worked on the Remain campaign. I passionately campaigned to Remain. And there were a lot of debates around the rights of EU nationals, about the freedom of movement, about the single market. These are big fundamental issues that really impact businesses and ordinary people up and down the country. And actually, if you're, what businesses want is certainty in this economy. And this provides them with certainty because the Conservatives are currently chopping and changing their mind on whether one day they're saying they're going to remain in the single market, one day they say they're not because it impacts on freedom of movement. So having a simple way in which, via a referendum, we can say to the British people, look, if you want this, we think it's a bad thing to leave the European Union. If you want this, you can have it. You've just got to vote for it. Or you can vote for our preferred option, which is a brighter future for Britain so that we can really change the direction of our country. Uh, and Will, in this election so far, leadership is, is playing a very big role. Um, what are the characteristics and the leadership qualities that your leader, Tim Farron, has in this election? Tim has the qualities of, very, of being very rooted in what he believes in as a liberal. He believes in an open uh, Britain, a Britain that's open to the world. He believes in a tolerant Britain where people can kind of get alongside each other, a society where people are decent to each other. And he believes in a united society. The Liberal Democrats actually, via our policies throughout our manifesto, seek to do all of those three things. I think, I mean, I've... I've known Tim for many years now, and the thing that I've seen from him is that he doesn't just talk to one crowd of people. He will go out into the streets, he'll go out, he'll talk to people, as we saw the other week when uh, he was in Oxford uh, and he got accosted by an old, uh, older voter, I think Malcolm was his name, uh, who um, tried to shout him down. He engaged him. Tim engaged him in a real conversation and that kind of stark contrast between Theresa May's campaign where journalists are being locked in rooms and Jeremy Corbyn's campaign where he's running journalists over, actually going out and speaking to voters and putting our pitch and saying we are the Liberal Democrats, we want a brighter future for our children and we want an open, tolerant and united Britain. Yeah, uh, and Tim Farron has claimed that uh, he is a committed Christian, um, and sadly he's been absolutely hounded by some of the mainstream media with his views on social policies, um, uh, and particularly getting that uh, interview where he was almost kind of caressed and forced to say that he that he believes that uh, gay sex is not a sin, isn't he? And also with pressure as well to to allow abortions to take place. Isn't he in great danger now of actually losing the Christian vote? Uh, many Christians would have voted for him because he's a Christian, but because of these issues and because of his stance, uh, he could actually lose a lot of the Christian vote in this country. Two things I'd say to that. One, it's we live in a tolerant nation and tolerance and liberalism go hand in hand. It's not just about the right to say yes 
It's also about the right to say no thank you. And we saw that, especially with the equal marriage bill going through. And Tim voted for equal marriage because it's not just about it's not just about those two people that love each other that want to get married. That's great. It's absolutely brilliant. It's also about the protection for churches to say, we respect what you're doing, but we don't want to partake in it. Faith is often a very personal thing. It's personal for me, as, as it's personal for millions of other Christians across the United Kingdom. We all have different views on how we should conduct faith and how others should conduct themselves in society. Faith does impact your politics, but with Tim it doesn't impact him in a sense that he doesn't care about people, that he doesn't believe that everyone deserves a chance, that everyone doesn't deserve that brighter future that we keep on talking about in this election. I think that's the message that should really get across. Not infighting about whether someone's very privately held views are of importance in this election. Uh, Will, but is, this is really a question of, of morality, really, and whether you actually believe that the word of God is literal. And so therefore it is, he's actually then going against what the actual Bible is saying um, in trying to appease the liberal establishment. And I mean, that is the danger that he faces in losing a lot of Christian votes and losing a lot of integrity, really, for not standing on core biblical beliefs at this election. I mean, we could debate core biblical beliefs, beliefs until we're blue in the face. Um, but I mean, I'm not a theologian in, in, in that field. Uh, the, the thing I would say, though, is Look at him on his record. Um, look at him on his record of fighting, um, of fighting for refugees, of fighting for the least, the lost and the lonely in our society. Uh, look at his rights on fighting for those that were escaping genocide in Srebrenica. Look at his record on fighting for those uh, that want decent housing, especially in his own constituency up in Cumbria. His record of talking about people as if they are people first and they deserve a decent outcome. Whether they are someone in a big posh house, whether they're someone on a council estate, or whether they're someone facing real poverty anywhere in the world. It's because of Tim's leadership that we've been able to do that. And I think with politicians, you can talk about morality, but at the end of the day, it's about votes that he casts alongside Liberal Democrat MPs in the House of Commons and the House of Lords. That's what matters here. And looking at Tim's record, I don't think he's got anything to, to frown about at all. One of the big uh, issues that um, many of our viewers or most of our viewers are concerned about is this growing marginalisation of Christians in society and also in politics as well. Uh, with many um, Christians being persecuted at work, praying with work colleagues or or offering to pray with a patient and then finding themselves being dismissed. What is the Liberal Democrats doing to protect Christian freedoms in this country? Oh, two things. Firstly, Liberal Democrat position is about protecting the rights of Christians and the rights of people in all religions to practice their religion in the way that they see fit. So whether that is praying at work, I mean, I, I pray at work as well, um, whether that's um, making sure that they have the Sabbath off, making sure they have that Sunday off so they can go to church, so they can rest and rest well. Um, no, I'm not really getting much of that in the election, but that's a different story. Um, but also, secondly, you talk about the marginalisation of, of Christians in politics. The one thing I'd say to that, and this is a personal thing for me, it's throughout my time kind of in politics, there's often a separation between politics and Westminster, where politics is talked about very freely and it's talked about in an open way. I go back to a lot of churches, um, not all, but a lot, and politics isn't really talked about there. And what that means then is that young people like myself, um, as I was back then, are not encouraged to enter into politics. They're not encouraged to stand up for their local community. So the one thing I'd say about the potential marginalisation of Christians in politics is that that is not inevitable. Uh, it's certainly happening, we're seeing fewer Christian MPs, that's undeniable. 
but actually Christians still have a large number of members of parliament, still a large number of members of the House of Lords, but it always starts off at the local level. It starts off in churches. I mean, churches are brilliant at community organising. If they put some of that effort and channeled it into politics, then we could really see a transformation of our society. Very much agree with you on that one, Will. Um, the Liberal Democrats deserve a lot of credit for the time that they were in the coalition government in helping to reduce the deficit which the current with previous Labour government got into the the awful mess that we're in. Um, what is the Liberal Democrats plan to balance the budget and also reduce the deficit? The plan is that we're basically going to look at how how we tax those with the broadest shoulders uh, and look at how so th with things like the mansion tax uh, so taxing those with um, very high value properties uh, and looking and actually seeing right how can we redress some of the horrific cuts that have happened uh, over especially the last two years for example and actually I, I always find it's better to go into the specifics on this one one of the cuts that the Conservative government has done over the last two years was free school meals for those under the age of four. That helped millions of families across the country and it was such a small percentage of the budget but actually the impact is very highly met. So for example one of the things that we're looking to do on the NHS is add a penny on, in, on the income tax rate and making sure that then that gives the NHS the sustainable funding it needs for now and for the future. On the economics, we've got some big beasts uh, in the party now. Vince Cable standing again in Twickenham, uh, Joe Swinson standing again in Eastern Bartonshire. These are people that led the way in terms of how we looked at the economy during the coalition uh, and also making it fairer for all. So having that brighter future. And actually, sorry to repeat the point about the EU. Part of our core message is, look, if you want to trade with our nearest partner, if you want to have an open uh, trading block with the largest trading block in the world, that is the European Union. You may not like it, there are some problems with it, I will not deny that. But actually, a vote for the Liberal Democrat is a vote to stop a hard Brexit and to build an open, tolerant, united society. Moving on to the issue of education, um, and in terms of your election manifesto for the 2010 general election, um, your party leader then, Nick Clegg, said that uh, your party would not put up university tuition fees, which uh, your party came under a lot of flack when you joined the, uh, the coalition government with the Conservatives in which tuition fees were, were raised. Um, what is your policy in terms of improving uh, education uh, and also today on the issue of university tuition fees? So firstly on the record, because I think it's very important to explain this, the night, it's not a tuition fee so much it's more a graduate tax. That was always the end policy that we were going for because the lower rate in which you pay it back means that actually what we've seen post the tuition fee rise is more students from disadvantaged backgrounds going to university than ever before. More students from black and ethnic minorities going to university than ever before. More students full stop going to university than ever before. So in a sense, it, the policy was sold badly. I get that. But actually the money that we saved from that was able then to go on the pupil premium to help the most disadvantaged in our society. So actually, I know the policy was sold badly and I know a lot of people were hurt by it. I think it's more a matter of trust than anything else. But actually what you have is a policy that is sustainable and that actually helps our country grow. Um, one of the uh, surprising issues to come up in your election manifesto, according to uh, our national newspapers, is the Liberal Democrats' plan to legalise the selling and the growing of cannabis if elected. Now, according to a lot of medical research, uh, cannabis causes mental health problems, and those who start off with cannabis often go on to much harder drugs. Um, is this a sensible policy? It's actually it's a sensible and evidence-based policy. Because what the Liberal Democrat plan is, is to take cannabis off the streets, off the hands of big gangs, 
heavily tax and regulate it. And the tax that that brings in will then go into health programs and education programs to build a much more, um, to try and crack down on some of the harder drugs uh, like crack cocaine uh, and LSD and other harder drugs like that to try and make sure that we reduce that, try and reduce the use of that. It's quite clear that the war on drugs, so-called, has failed. You get, you get young people, especially young uh, uh, people from ethnic minority backgrounds, who are much more likely to be convicted of drug offences, and it's a very disproportionate uh, very disproportionate laws that you're looking at here. So taking it out of the hands of the Mr Bigs, of the leaders of gangs, and putting it into a regulated and high tax market is actually the best of both worlds here. I want to move on to the uh, issue of, of security because in recent years we've seen a, a, a huge rise in Islamic terrorist attacks across the continent of Europe. We also experienced one here in Westminster mm. in March as well. Uh, what are the Liberal Democrats' plans to keep us uh, safe from the threat of terrorism? So the Liberal Democrats have committed to the 2% uh, of NATO funding. Um, we believe that this is important because to live, uh, for Britain to be safe, for us to enjoy the freedoms that we have, we need to protect ourselves abroad. Now, Tim has set out five main criteria for if we would uh, intervene uh, in action. You can read the full uh, part of that um, on, on the website, uh, libdems.org.uk. Um, and it's that thing of, I mean, so I was there, so I work in Westminster, I was there on the day of the attack, and one of the things that that you saw, actually, I came in the day after, and people in Westminster, you could see that everyone was shaken, but we riled round. We were incredibly resilient. Um, and I think it's that ability for people in London, for people in Paris, for people across the continent to say, we will not tolerate this. That is the more important thing here. Um, we're working hard on cybersecurity crime and making sure that actually as part of that 2% spending that, that, that those technologies are kind of updated so that we don't actually have stuff that happened with the NHS um, just, just last week. So I think the main crux of it is Britain needs to defend itself against the threats uh, of ISIS and against the threats uh, that face our world. We do that by being open, tolerant and most importantly united in an attack against uh, not just threats of Islamic extremism but also actually threats about Islamophobia as well. In my patch in Tower Hamlets you have the East London Mosque uh, in my constituency. Some of the Islamophobia that many moderate, um, moderate Muslims have faced there is absolutely horrific and should not be happening in our society today. In recent years we've uh, also witnessed uh, sadly a huge increase in, in anti-Semitism not only in this country but in Europe and across the world. What is the Liberal Democrats uh, plan to to confront uh, this oldest of hatreds. Mm. So, uh, as you would have heard me say over and over again, it's about building an open, tolerant and united society. And that tolerance is something that we need to build. I mean, the rise in hate crime after the EU referendum happens. Now, I'm not saying here that people that voted leave are adding to this. What I am saying is that you've got um, you, you've got a group of people that have now been given license to do this. Anti-Semitism is not acceptable in our society. Um, and the Liberal Democrats will always be standing against it and we try and root it out wherever we see it. And we saw that with the expulsion of David Ward from the party, our candidate in Bradford West, who made some very, uh, in my view, very ill-judged remarks at best um, about uh, the relationship in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Um, and yes, I think when you look at the way that we've reacted to it, the way that the Labour Party have reacted to it, that stark contrast is something that should be taken note of. Good. Uh, in, in, for our viewers, the issue of Israel is very important, particularly its security uh, and also this horrendous campaign that's uh, targeted the one true democracy in the Middle East, which is the boycott, divestments and sanctions movement. Um, what is your party's position on Israel and also helping to bring reconciliation and peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians? So the, the basically, I mean, there's no simple, I can say basically, there's no real simple way forward for this solution. It's been going on for decades. 
one of the things that we want to see is a dropping of arms and just say, look, we need to get you guys around a table. It's not for us to dictate to them how they should settle and leave their, lead their lives. What is down to us is to stop the bloodshed of children and mothers, wives and fathers and to actually make sure that that area of the world can be at peace with each other. And uh, my, my final question to you, uh, Will, is sadly the Christians in the Middle East today are on the verge of being ethnically cleansed from the region. Um, they've been targeted by ISIS and other Islamist uh, groups throughout the region. Um, what is your policy in order to protect those precious Christian minorities in the Middle East? So we support the, um, the UN um, the UN statement to try and protect Christians in the region uh, and what we would try to do uh, is, is try and intervene in the protection for humanitarian reasons and this is a humanitarian issue. I mean it's, uh, Christians and Kurds in the region as well are being heavily, uh, being heavily um, persecuted that just simply cannot happen. We saw it when um, the party under Paddy Ashtown um, got involved in, in the Balkan region and in, in Serbia there to try and stop ethnic cleanse, in, sorry, in um, Herzegger uh, and, um, uh, sorry, yeah, sorry. <laughs> try, trying to think how to pronounce the long name. But we saw that there and one of the things that we have to do now is to try and build a better Middle East, one that, one that is sustainable. Uh, and one of the things that that means is to actually stand back rather than move forward. Because we saw how interventions by Tony Blair in Iraq could have disastrous effects. Actually, us standing back and seeing how the world could be a much more peaceful place is much more important. You've got an opportunity now to talk directly to our viewers as to why they should vote Liberal Democrats come Thursday the 8th of June. This election is about changing Britain's future. It's about the future direction of our country. And if you want a country that is open, tolerant and united, where people are decent to each other, then the Liberal Democrats are your only option. Theresa May is making decisions every single day about this country's future. And what we want to see is a, is a situation where actually that can be put to bed in a referendum, where actually this election for Brexit and for the future of our country, we believe that actually the final deal should be put before the British people and that you should have the final stay. We started this process with democracy. We don't want to end it with a stitch up. Uh, Will Dyer, I just want to thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to interview today for this uh, general election. Thank you very much, it's been a pleasure.